We are grateful to gather on the land of Treaty 6 territory and for the care of this land through the centuries. We are all treaty people. We are proud to be on the affirming ministry journey. When we come to worship, it is prayer. When we share our lives with one another, it is prayer. When we support one another, it is prayer. When we share our concerns, our gratitude, and our work, it is prayer. Let us celebrate all that God gives us as we pray together, love one another, and breathe in God together. May the spark of Christ shine in you. Today I want to talk about call to action number one, child welfare. We call upon the federal, provincial, territorial, and Aboriginal governments to commit to reducing the number of Aboriginal children in care. Indigenous families and communities had their systems for caring for their children based on their cultural practices, laws, and traditions. Children were viewed as gifts from the creator. The parent's responsibility was to raise the spirit of the child. Why is reconciliation important for Indigenous child welfare? Reconciliation is about truth-telling, acknowledging, restoring, and relating all lead, lead to building trust as Indigenous people, it is important that we respect one another's worldviews, that we are heard in meaningful ways and that our views inform policy and practice. Together with settler people as allies, we can have meaningful outcomes. For too long, Indigenous children have been overrepresented in the foster care system. The care system has been underfunded and Indigenous children have been very poorly served by Canada's Child and Family Services regime. The system has failed to recognize the diverse cultures and traditions of Indigenous communities and has been part of the plan to colonize and assimilate First Nations and Métis Nation children. 
The history of Indigenous children in care stretches back to the dark chapters of the residential schools and the 60s scoop. Both of these have caused lasting damage to Indigenous peoples and their communities. Because of this history, Indigenous people have a deep distrust in the child welfare system. The new federal Indigenous Child and Family Services legislation, which grew out of Bill C-92, came into force on January 1, 2020. The Act, while imperfect in many respects, seeks to address long-standing problems for Indigenous children with the existing Child and Family Services systems in Canada. The new legislation sets out to implement Canada's obligations under the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of the Child, as well as the calls to action from the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. The main intent of the Act is to provide Indigenous communities with a mechanism to exercise their inherent jurisdiction over the care of their own children and families in accordance with their own traditional laws and values. Most import importantly, and at long last, it provides for that exercise of jurisdiction to be recognized by the federal government as federal law, which takes priority over provincial child and family services. The Act, for all its limitation, also provides a legal pathway for Indigenous communities to resume, resume care for their own children and families. The Act puts in place a number of minimum standards which will govern Indigenous child and welfare services in Canada, prioritizing an Indigenous child's culture and community in each case. Last summer, the Muskeg Lake Cree Nation, where I belong, told the federal government that in, it intended to take control and establish its own child and family services. Now the chief and council have drafted a law which establishes the terms of reference for a kinship council composed of family heads who will inform the community as it shapes its new service. We will work to create a program based in Cree customs and traditions and the values of Wakotawin, our kinship and good child rearing. These values will ensure that our children are cared for in a culturally appropriate way. To have full rights to care for our own children will allow us to make sure that we don't sentence another generation to provincial child welfare. This will also allow us to get to the roots of many families' pain, the intergenerational trauma from all the attempts to assimilate us. We have to get this right. We have to be well grounded in our natural laws and culture for our children's sake. Merciful God, we would rather stop your spirit when she leads us to familiar places, people, ideas, and situations. We would rather choose how your spirit comes and receive the gifts as we believe we deserve. Help us to remember that your spirit has a gift freely given to each of us for the common good. Help us trust the Spirit's leading. Amen. Just
A reading of Psalm 1. Blessed are those who do not follow the advice of the wicked, who refuse to associate with wrongdoers, or even to sit with people who mock and belittle others. But their delight is the law of the God, and on that law they meditate day and night. They are like trees planted by streams of water, yielding their fruit in the season. Their leaves do not wither, and all that they do, they prosper. The wicked are not so, but are like the chaff, driven away by the wind. They won't have roots to anchor them when judgment comes, nor will corrupt individuals be given a place at the gathering of the just. For God watches over the way of those who do justice, but those a path of violence and injustice will find themselves lost. A reading from John 17, verses 6 to 21. I have manifested your name to those you gave me from the world. They were yours, and you gave them to me, and they have kept your word. Now that they know that everything you have given me does indeed come from you, for the words that you gave to me I have given to them, and they have received them, and know in truth that I came from you. I am asking on their behalf. I am not asking on the behalf of the world, but on behalf of those whom you gave me. Because they are yours, all mine are yours, and yours are mine, and I have been glorified in them. And now I am no longer in the world, but they are in the world, and I am coming to you. Creator, protect them in your name that you have given me, so that they may be one, as we are one. While I was with them, I protected them in your name that you have given me. But now I am coming to you, and I speak these things to the world, so that they may have joy fulfilled them in themselves. I have given them your word, and the word has hated them because they do not belong to the world, just as I do not belong to the world. I am not asking you to take them out of the world, but I ask you to protect them from the evil one. Consecrate them, make them holy through the truth, for your word is truth, and you have sent me into the world, so I have sent them into the world. For their sakes I consecrate myself, so that they may also be consecrated in the truth. I don't pray for them alone. I pray that they all may be one, as you, Abba, are in me, and I in you. Sometimes the world is just too much with us. We turn on the TV and we see violence right now, especially in Israel and the occupied Palestinian territories. We don't know what to do, at least until we get the action and prayer request emails from the groups we belong to, thankfully. And COVID on top of it all. And we can't even get on a plane for a vacation or a visit because we're playing our part in stopping the spread of the virus. At least it's the season to head out to the cabin or along the beautiful river with its many trails. Today's scripture addresses the longing we have to withdraw from the fray. At the turn of the first century, the Christian community faced hostilities. How good it would feel to cut loose and find some anonymous place to hole up with their own group, savoring the stories of Jesus, sharing bread and wine and prayer, away from the maddening crowd. This scripture is John's sermon delivered as the instruction of Jesus to a community that is exhausted with the world and is ready to be done with it. The words connect to our contemporary exhaustion with the world's ceaseless violence and corruption, our frequent feelings of despair over the inability to make a difference, it seems. But Jesus is crystal clear that there is no escape from the realities of the world. He speaks to them in the same world where they live and where they will find joy in themselves. Or, to provide another equally valid translation, among themselves. Yes, they can be a community. And yes, they can find joy in that community. But no, 
the community is not to abandon the world. No, I wasn't sent to you to get you out of here, he said. I'm here to send you back in, just as God sent me into the world. But first, we're going to hang out together, spend some quality time together, resting, kicking back, learning, growing, challenging each other, finding joy amongst each other within ourselves, getting creative, mending, healing. I will consecrate your need for growth, truth, and holiness. Let's you make that word wholeness, whole in mind, body, and spirit. Then I will send you, commission you to go into the world empowered and accompanied by the spirit, your advocate, a real and present help to you. So John and Jesus offer the people an alternative model of living in the world, but not being of it. In the history of Christianity, always, there's always been monasteries, convents, places of retreat and pilgrimage. Look how popular walking the Camino as a pilgrimage has become. Camps and retreat centers like Naramata, BC, have been such places in the United Church. Have some of you experienced a Naramata summer? The classic Naramata week involved a study group in the morning, swimming and resting and playing in the afternoon, speakers and singing and water slides in the evenings, wonderful children's programs. It was a touch of paradise, picking luscious ripe cherries, apricots, peaches and plums from the trees planted beside the water. Just like in our Psalm today, and we Naramata people felt rooted and planted just like those trees by the water, soaking in learning and the good company and the loveliness. It was sitting under one of those trees every morning for a week in a study group led by Reverend Dr. Garth Legg of National United Church staff that I first heard about apartheid in South Africa and the liberation movements calling for our solidarity. Headlines in a Penticton newspaper in 1971 quoted Dr. Lake defending the Reverend Tad Mitsui, a United Church minister and a Japanese Canadian who was detained by the South African police for talking about apartheid. In the mid seventies, I, I fled to Naramata for this study week getting some respite from my exhausting work in the inner city of Vancouver. Yet in that tranquil atmosphere, sitting under that tree in the study group, my mind was opened to the lives and struggles of people far away. I went back to Vancouver, fired up to share what I had learned and make common cause, finding an anti-apartheid group. Before you knew it, we were off trying to get people to boycott South African wine, remember those days? Later, I went on one of the United Church's come and see exposure tours to Palestine and Israel. What I learned there rocked my assumptions about what was going on. Later, I co-led a come and see tour for young adults, opening our eyes to the beauty and to the troubles in the Holy Land. I think this is what Jesus meant by consecrating our need for growth, truth, and holiness, wholeness, and then commissioned to go out and share. Jesus and John gave us this alternative model of being church community. They consecrated a rhythm of rest, retreat, reflection, and renewal of minds, bodies, and spirits. Then moving out again into the world to risk, act, and dare. Educators in the United Church called it the action reflection model. You go a little bit inwards, then you go a little bit outwards and you reflect on actions you do out there 
you reflect uh, with people in your circle. Communities of faith live in a creative tension in the world, but not of the world. A prayerful community takes seriously its intercessory role in solidarity with the victims of injustice and marginalization while denouncing the root causes of these unjust structures. This is how we can engage with the world, but not be consumed by it, nor take on the values of materialism, consumerism, and privilege that is the way of the world. We are meant to spend time in beautiful places, close to nature. We are meant to find joy in one another, in creativity coming from deep within, sharing perhaps art or music, drama, in playing with our children. We are meant to find places and people to hear our brokenness, our despair, our grief, our need for healing. And then we are sent out, not alone, but with the authority and accompaniment of the Spirit, who is our advocate, a real and present help. A friend asked why we use the word commissioning at the end of our service. Our Wednesday Bible discussion group thought that the words consecrated, sanctified, and commissioning are grouped together shades of the same meaning. Just as Jesus sent out his followers, Dr. Lake commissioned us to be in solidarity with the people of South Africa. There is a duty to share what you have learned. There is a divine impetus behind what you're being asked to do. You're offering something of yourself. God is calling you to a special purpose. God sends you into the world because you are unique funny, kind, brave, faithful, and so much more. And perhaps if you're not feeling any of those qualities I've just mentioned on any given day, you're not feeling like you're shining today, then remember, you can always go about your day doing acts of kindness. We laughed in our Wednesday group when someone spotted a sign saying, Kind people are more valuable to God than mean Christians, or something to that effect. So follow the divine impetus within, nudging you to rest, have some renewal and reflection time. Then the spirit arrives, breathless, to send you out again, learning, growing, sharing in solidarity, loving the world that God loves. How are you called to love the world right now? How are you called to renew and retreat? God honors both these rhythms. And the spirit does not send you alone in this, but is sent to keep you company, to advocate for you, and to bring you companions on the journey. Thanks be to God. Yeah.
please join me in prayer. Living Spirit, Advocate, Helper, you move where you will, opening our hearts, minds, and hands to reach out. You move us to be curious, to learn, to change our minds, to act on the best truth we have. You stir us to care, to be intrigued by difference, to better understand one another. Bring your justice-seeking, peacemaking energy to the troubled parts of our world and our lives. We pray especially today for a just peace that will stop the bombs and the guns and the airstrikes in Israel-Palestine. We pray for the compassion, courage, and commitment of all parties, peoples, and countries around the world to demand that the violence stops, that the occupation ends, and that a just peace is forged. We pray for the violence to stop now and for immediate care for those who are injured. We give thanks for our United Church of Canada's engagement with peacemaking, and we pray for our Palestinian and Israeli partners in mission. Bring healing to our part of the world as well, in the many ways we need it. Bless all in our care with the healing and wholeness they need. In Jesus' name, amen. May the blessing of God go before you. May her grace and peace abound. May her spirit live within you. May her love wrap you round. May her blessing remain with you always. May you walk on holy ground.